for CME Point by EBEC in collaboration with Medtronic. My name is Jack, uh, your host for today, the Chief of Cardiology at National Heart Center Singapore. We have two uh, esteemed speakers today, respectively. We have Dr. Bilai Patel from Glen Eagles JPMC Brunei talking to us on the 10 tips and tricks in treating uncrossable distal lesions. Our second speaker is Dr. Beatrice Valkariso from uh, Barcelona, Spain. She's going to have a show and tell on three cases of how she overcame problematic distal lesions. We're very happy to have Sengkang General Hospital Cath Lab host us today for the live transmission. And our operators are the team for National Heart Center at Sengkang General. Respectively, we have the two twin chin duo, Professor Chin Chi Tang, as well as Dr. Chin Chi Yang, who is uh, doing the live case and uh, imaging uh, narration, respectively. Our lead operator is Dr. Muhammad Idu. Our esteemed panelists will include from Malaysia, Professor Chi Kok Han from University of Malaya Medical Center, Professor Gaku from uh, Medicine Kindai University from Kindai, Japan, Dr. Christopher Ku from the National University Heart Center. Our coordinator today is Dr. Ke Yen San from the National Heart Center. A pitch for upcoming webinars. Tomorrow, we have APSC Emerging Leaders, a CHIP summit focusing on calcium modification. 15 April, we have another physiology session focusing on the use of intravascular imaging in bifurcation. Some disclaimers, this webinar is copyrighted by APSC. The views belong solely to the faculty members. The webinar is currently live streaming by Wonder Facebook and YouTube pages of APSC. CME points will be awarded to those who are connected throughout the full duration after completing a short survey. So without further ado, let's get started and welcome Dr. Bilai Pillai from uh, Brunei to talk about the 10 tips and tricks in doing uncrossable lesions. Dr. Bilai, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the um, invitation. And it's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon. Sorry, Dr. Bilai, you are muted. So Bilai, we can see your screen now. Uh, please go ahead once you are muted. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, your, your screen popped off again. Maybe you can share again. Please go ahead. You're muted, Dr. Bilai. Not too sure why. Can you unmute yourself again? Uh, Dr. Bilai, do you mind if you unmute yourself again? You're muted one more time. Can you unmute first? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. You're good now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep, loud and clear. Okay. So. Thank you very much for the um, invitation um, to talk about uncrossable lesions um, and, and 10 tips and tricks. So my name is Bilal Patel um, and I've recently relocated from the UK to Brunei Dar es Salaam uh, and our hospital is on the coast and this is the view um, that we've got from outside the window. So very fortunate. So when we talk about uncrossable lesions, um, many sort of things come to mind and we've got a huge amount of different sort of equipment techniques available um, and sometimes it can be quite confusing and one of the roles of today's talk is to really unravel this and to come up with um, a step-by-step -step way with tips and tricks that's going to help deal with the patient with the uncrossable lesion. So you know say um, you know Brunei is on the island of Borneo and I've got a great passion for trekking um, and there's not much in the way of sort of hills and mountains where we are but there's plenty of jungle and trekking through the PCI jungle um, is very similar to trekking through the jungle itself. And when we're dealing with the uncrossable lesion in complex PCI, a lot of sort of planning has to go into place. And, and it's similar to when you, you know, you're going on one of these walks, you're planning with equipment, your routes and, and the team that you're going to have to have and sort of any safety equipment that you need. So what's the definition of an uncrossable lesion? 
is those that cannot be crossed with a balloon after successful guide wire crossing. And how much of a problem is it that the uncrossable lesion? So, you know, the, this group looks at over sort of eight and a half thousand CTOs in 10 years. Um, and this is looking mainly at CTO patients around close to 10% of all CTOs you're able to cross with a wire, but you wouldn't be able to cross with your device or balloon. It's the second most common mode of PCI failure. The uncrossable lesion um, patient tends to take more time. We're using more radiation, more contrast volume, and you've got increased um, adverse outcomes and MACE in this group of patients. So are we able to identify these um, beforehand? You know, can we predict? So these patients generally have got more calcification, more tortuous vessels. Often they've had previous bypass surgery, um, and there's a higher incidence of instant restenosis in this group of patients. And they've got higher JCTO scores compared to those without uncrossable lesions. So in navigating the uncrossable lesions in PCI, it's very important we use the right tools. And we're going to go over some of these, including the sort of you know, guide support, guide extensions, microcatheters, balloons and atherectomy devices. So with two main concepts when we're thinking about navigating the uncrossable lesion, um, and one of them is how do you increase support? And this can be done in many ways, which will be discussed. And the second is, is there anything we can do at the lesion level that's going to make it easier for us to cross the uncrossable lesion? So now I'm starting off with my 10 tips and tricks. And we have to start really with um, a really solid foundation. And part of the solid foundation of complex PCI is ensuring that we've got really good guide support from the outset. And with the guide support, we're relying on contralateral support of the aorta to provide support um, of the guide. So it's important that we use the right shape of guide that's gonna provide support and also the right size of guide for difficult uncrossable lesions. Uh, and I said before that a lot of these are in CTOs, but often we will find them in non-CTO patients as well, starting with a large lumen guide, seven French guide um, up front is wise. And sometimes you may even decide to go bigger, but generally seven French will, will do the job. Um, and this is a trade-off here between using an aggressive guide for support and the risk of dissection or damping of pressure. So tip number two is use of um, guide extension. So there's a whole host of tools that we've got available to us. And, and it's important that we try to utilize these um, in, in the best way possible. So guide extensions is quite a clever, a very simple invention that's been around for a few years now. Uh, and these are um, you know, extensions that we pass over the wire that provide additional support and is able to often we can get the guide extensions deep into the vessel to provide significantly more support. So there's a, a, quite a few of these on the market now. I mean, the guideline has been around for a long time. Um, we've got the telescope from Medtronic that's got very good deliverability, the Guidezilla, uh, and the Gideon, and then there's others which have got balloons incorporated into them, such as the trap liner, which is sometimes used for ADR CTO cases. So in terms of techniques for putting your guideliner down for the uncrossable lesion, and two main techniques are used. One is the anchor, where you place the balloon um, distal and then push the guide liner over with some negative traction on the balloon shaft. And then the inchworming technique um, is the most commonly used where you pass the guide liner down and then inflate a balloon half in, half out at low pressures. And as the balloon comes down, you then push your guide liner over, inchworming it further down into the vessel, which is a safe way of putting your guide liner or guide extension, which you choose deeper into the vessel. So tip number three is use of um, low profile balloons uh, of, in PCI. The first, um, often the first thing we'll do is go with a small balloon, particularly if it's a very tight stenosis. And in terms of low profile balloons, there's many different balloons available on the market um, to go. And a lot of these are quite similar. Some have got different crossing profiles. Um, one of the tips is to use a longer balloon. If we go for quite a short balloon, the, the middle marker um, on the balloon is where actually the diameter is greater. So the lowest crossing will be 
at the, at the tip of the balloon. So if we go for a longer balloon, it allows more of the balloon to go in to the lesion before you get the area where the marker is, where the diameter is bigger. The blimp balloon is a balloon where it uses part of the, it's a very, very short monorail balloon that uses part of the wire to help you to get to get through and cross. Um, but often you'll find that even using the small balloons, you will not be able to get through the uncrossable lesion. So tip number four is use of microcatheters. Now there's a whole different range of microcatheters on the market and it can be, you know, it's important to know um, what the qualities are, and which ones are gonna be beneficial for the uncrossable lesion. So we've got small external diameter microcatheters, such as the fine cross Caravel uh, and Turnpike LP. And then you've got the large external diameter ones, Corsair Pro, Turnpike Spiral um, and Turnpike. And then you've got the plaque modification. So the Tornus and Tornpike Gold, a plaque modification, which I'll talk about shortly. Now, the for the uncrossable lesion, the best type of microcatheters are going to be the large external diameter ones. So that's your Turnpike and your Corsair type of microcatheter. And then you've got the lesion modifying ones, such as the Turnpike and Turnpike Gold. So the... the these are um, talkable microcatheters and they improve um, your, you get improved transmission of torque through the catheter and they're very trackable as well. But the design is quite complex. So for the turnpike, you've got these two separate bidirectional coils going um, over a braid and the Corsair, you've got multiple braided wires all the way around and then you've got this tapered tip to, to get through. And the principle these work on is by rotating, you get buildup of torque and transmission of the torque down to where your problem is in the vessel. When you're looking at device modification microcatheters, so these are ones that will actually sort of, you know, sort of grind the way through or the device through your um, uncrossable lesion. Tonus, um, and you've got turnpike gold. So the tonus is one that you have to rotate anti-clockwise and turnpike gold you rotate clockwise you have to be careful with the tornus because if you do too many rotations you can end up actually getting the device trapped in the lesion um, which can be problematic and may require surgical extraction so the other thing to um, mention with these micro catheters particularly the the, the turnpike body of micro catheters you've got the turnpike spiral which has got a nylon um, or a spool around which helps you go through difficult lesions. So tip number five is using anchoring. So we've got some options that we can use with balloon anchoring. So you've got your uncrossable lesion there, and then you pass a wire into a side branch um, and inflate the balloon. So often in the right coronary artery, this may be a, a marginal branch or a conus branch, uh, and in an LAD diagonal, it, it could be the, the diagonal. And sometimes this technique um, you know, you can get very good results with this, but you have to be careful of getting ischemia, particularly if you're using a, a diagonal, for example. Um, the balloon anchor goes up. This provides additional support. And often with that, you'll either get your balloon through. And if you don't get the balloon through, it's very useful to get your microcatheter through the uncrossable lesion. So tip number six is um, grenadoplasty. And this is where we burst the balloon in the uncrossable lesion. So this was first described a few years ago and they found that this was successful in 50% of the patients that they tried it in. Your wire has crossed, but the balloon will not cross. But you see that just the nose of the balloon is in the lesion. Then you inflate the balloon to bursting pressures and then quickly deflate, deflate the balloon and then take the balloon out. And then when you pass with another device, be it another new balloon or a micro catheter, then often you'll find that this will have um, modified the disease to be able to get through. So tip number seven is using something called the wire cutting technique. So this is where you've crossed the lesion. This does require passing a second wire through the lesion. And then you, you inflate one balloon over one wire deflate and then you put a balloon over the second wire take it down to the lesion inflate again and you do this repeatedly with a sort of seesaw cutting technique 
So this group compared this technique with the tornus and actually found that you have significantly increased um, device success and procedural success using the seesaw wire cutting technique. So that's another option available. And then we've got um, more aggressive techniques such as atherectomy. So the, the two main modes of atherectomy used are, is rotational atherectomy, and then you've got laser um, atherectomy. So with laser atherectomy, um, the, the benefit is that you can use the wire that is already crossed. So that's the benefit with using laser to be able to get through the device and crossable lesion. You may run into trouble if the severe calcification um, and it's one of the markers of um, what your chance of failure is going to be with the degree of calcification that's there. With rotational atherectomy, um, you cannot, you, you need to use um, a rotor wire or, or to be able to perform your rotablation. So you've still got the issue of getting, um, either exchanging the rotor wire, which will mean putting a micro catheter beyond the lesion or wiring with the rotor wire, which can be very difficult with these complex lesions. But what is generally advised is you pass your microcatheter as far as possible, sometimes with the use of anchoring balloon to get the microcatheter distal um, with the nose nudged into the lesion, then you'll exchange for the rotor wire. Um, sometimes it will pass, sometimes the rotor wire will not pass, but if you can get the rotor wire through, then you're able to perform your rotational atherectomy and finish the case. So now we're going to tip nine, and this is where we're going for um, some of the CTO techniques use, causing dissection and then um, re-entry. So there's, the, there's a, a number of um, potential ways of dealing with this. Now you already have a wire that's through um, your uncrossable lesion. It's important to remember at the outset that we need to confirm that the, the wire is in the true lumen. So if it's a CTO case, then you know, you'll have your retrograde in injection to confirm where you are. Then with the second wire, you're creating a dissection. And on the second wire, then there's two ways of um, finishing the case. You can use the second wire in the dissection plane and blow a balloon up in there to externally crush the lesion from outside thereby modifying it to be able to pass devices on your first guide wire. So this is known as subintimal external crush technique. And the second is performing standard dissection re-entry using um, either stingray balloon or one of, one of the um, other dual lumen catheters, such as a recross to re-enter. But now you're going into sort of techniques where, you know, you... Um, you, know, you have to be familiar with these techniques and you have to really try um, your other techniques before going down, down this, um, this line. And finally, tip number 10 is making sure that, you know, that um, you've got a great team on board with you because for these, these cases, you need the planning, you need the mindset, you need the team to be on board. They can often be quite long and they can be difficult. So it's a really important part of, of the 10 tips and tricks. So I've got a case example here of a right coronary artery, which has got um, instant re restenosis CTO with symptomatic angina. And we went with an anterior grade approach with retrograde injections. So there's the um, uh, occlusion within the stent. We have, we've got our retrograde pictures that shows good retrograde filling of the vessel. Got a seven French AL guide, um, and we see that there's difficulty um, crossing with our micro catheter. So we've tried the micro catheter, turn pike spiral, and now we're using balloon anchor technique. So with the balloon anchor, we're able to get the turn pike round and then switch over to a uh, rotor wire, rotor blade, and then you can stem the vessel. So, in summary, you know. Important that you've got good guide support and guide extension, it's the, the basics and foundation, then use of balloons and micro catheters and anchoring. You can consider using the seesaw wire cutting technique and, and micro dissection or grenadoplasty. Then you've got rotational atherectomy and laser. Um, and then finally, dissection reentry or subintimal external crush techniques. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Patel. Indeed, that was 
put it forth on uh, all the tips and tricks I've ever seen before. So that was fantastic. Um, maybe I can get the round of comments from uh, our panel of very experienced interventionists here. D Dr. Kaku, uh, which method do you ideally use actually uh, among all the tips and tricks here? And, and Thank what, you very what much. So no, nowadays, I think uh, the most of the operators use a uh, guided extension for the, first, uh, for the first option. And if it doesn't cross, then, then maybe you use anchor balloon technique to cross the microcatheter to blisterly and then change the rotor wire. That's, uh, I think, a regular way to approach distal uh, uncrossable lesion. But uh, I have uh, one question to Dr. Patel. And uh, how often do you use laser, eczema laser, uh, catheter to cross the distal lesion. I have so, not many experience. Of. Uh, likewise, so I think it's something we had in one of my previous centers I worked in, um, but the um, availability is, is limited yes. mainly because the, the hardware is um, very expensive. Yes, um, that's right. And if, if your um, EP team are using the laser machine for extractions, for example, then mm -hmm. it's very easy for us just to get the catheters. But if they're not, then it's very difficult to justify um, the additional cost, particularly with all the other tools that we've got available. Thank you. Um, Pohan, is there a difference in the algorithm? Because not everyone has all the toolbox of laser and stuff. Well, what is your yeah. flow? Is it guide extension first and then, or do you upfront try to do some attractomy to ease the passage? I think what Dr. Patel mentioned is very, very good in the sense that go back to the basics, get the, get the guide with a good support first. I think by changing the guide somehow solve quite a few problems of uh, crossing the devices across the uncrossable uh, lesion. But I think in that situation, I also use quite a lot of uh, guide extension. I think that is a very, very important tool to actually have in a cat lab. It actually solves uh, a lot of uh, problems for me in, in my setting. Uh, I do a lot of anchoring technique also, uh, but I have to be uh, uh, honest that I don't actually have laser in my lab and uh, I have yet to actually use a uh, rotablator straight away to, to go uncross. Uh, I'm not sure whether the rest actually has a bad, much better experience than me. Chris, uh, do you have any advice if you're using a guide extension, uh, using a rotablation to guide extension? Any, any advice there? No, not really, but I think for uh, I think the main thing was really just for Dr. Patel's point was that I agree that a lot of it is actually solved with good guide support, um, guide catheter support. Uh, sometimes you might want to use a bigger French, sometimes you might want to actually use a gold femoral. But actually, I think um, a lot of it really sometimes it depends on why the lesion is impossible. Is it torturous or is it calcified? And I think sometimes if it is calcified, then I think really uh, you might actually consider upfront arthrectomy instead of um other kind of uh, devices firsthand. Uh, Dr. Beatrice, uh, anything else to add before you go to the live case? Uh, Dr. Beatrice, your, your mic is still having an issue. Maybe you can rejoin uh, in a bit. So so perhaps I think it's time. Let's, let's go to the live case. I think I see the operators all waiting to uh, hear from us and uh, show us a case. Can we share screen from the Care Flat first, Cam 1? Yes, uh, so we're seeing the very handsome faces of our main operator, Dr. Idu and uh, Professor Chin. So we'll, we'll have them say hello to us first. Uh, maybe you test your mic. Uh, can we have them unmuted? Idu and Chi Tang, can you hear me? Hi, 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 Dr. Tan. I can hear you. Can you all hear us? Yeah, loud and clear. I can't hear Chi Tang at the moment. Chi Tang, yep. you're there. Nope. Hello, everyone. Yes, um, so good. Um, I'm going to see whether Yan San can help me share the case for today. Then maybe have you narrate the case and share with us what you're going to do. Uh, Yan San, are you able to share the case proper? Yep, we're going to switch on the slides now. Uh, one minute. Okay, so we'll stop share from the Care Lab. We'll have a look at the case proper. And then we'll have uh, all the panelists comment to the case later. In a bit. Are you able to share screen now? So Care Lab, can you stop share? Cam 1, stop share. Then we'll look at the PowerPoint. Thank you. So maybe Idu, you can start off by telling us about the case we're going to do today. 
Okay, so our patient is a 76-year-old gentleman with a prior medical history of hypertension, dyslipidemia, as well as newly diagnosed diabetes. He was actually admitted mid of uh, March for NSTEMI with uh, heart failure. And uh, at that time, coronary angiography showed triple vessel disease with the culprit being uh, osteal uh, LED. So he underwent a, a stand, a trio by 48 stand from the osteal to the mid LED. Uh, his ejection fraction at the time was uh, preserved. Um, yep, so these are these factors. Okay, maybe you can show the next slide. Uh, his labs, he has this uh, mild anemia, which is uh, microcytic, but, but chronic, probably uh, some kind of a tail trait. Cretinine is normal. Uh, LDL is uh, elevated at 3.0, and HB1C is elevated uh, 6.7. Next. Okay, so this was actually the pre and post uh, LAO cranial shots uh, for the LAD. Uh, so it's a long uh, 3048 stance. Uh, next slide. And the RO cranial view. Yeah. So it might be difficult to appreciate, but actually the osteal uh, LED was actually uh, tight. The circumflex had moderate disease and we decided to treat that medically. Uh, so our, can we go on to the next slide? So the right, however, also has uh, diffuse uh, moderate and severe disease uh, from the proximal to the mid. Um, and that is actually our target for today. Uh, there is some classifications that you can see. So, uh, that's why we're here to discuss uh, what else we're going to do. Next, he's, uh, he's because of the anemia and his age, uh, he is considered a high uh, bleeding risk based on the depth score as well as the precise depth score. Okay, so that's our target, the right, and uh, maybe I'll discuss with the panel uh, what our strategy should be. Um, so maybe you can share screen from the cap lab again uh, and show us. Uh, and Joe again, if you may. Okay. So uh, this is actually just a shot on the left. So it shows the left, uh, the stands are patent. Okay, and it's a large uh, wraparound uh, LED. So it's more like a co-dominant kind of system. And this is actually the right. So we actually took a, a initial shot and that's a wire to, to measure. Um, so again, there's diffuse disease. And uh, what we've done so far. Okay, yeah, so Jack, so this is, uh, this is today's shot. Maybe we can get some comments. So, so in summary, we have uh, we are targeting the RCA, very diffuse lesion. The, the whole RCA essentially looks diseased. La. So, um, and there's calcium as well, as, as Muhammad mentioned. Um, and geographically, it's not very clear how calcified, how, how um, difficult this, um, case may or may not be so uh you know we'd like to have some views from the from the panelists how how you would approach this maybe case. you can start out with dr patel first so he gave us a lecture on uh, all the tips and tricks uh of doing this uh dr patel do you have any guidance on the approach the guiding and everything else yeah, that so I mean, share screen? yeah yeah so, so i think um i mean here's a fairly diffuse sort of long area of disease you know you've got disease in the mid and then you've got more distal disease there as well um there is some calcification there um looking at this um it's not one where i'd go up front with um a very supportive guide like an amplax for example i think you know going with a standard um jr guy is reasonable um and really this is one where um, I'd want to really delineate the anatomy and looking at the lesion there, I'm wondering if um, you probably will be able to get an imaging catheter through there to see what's going on. Um, you know, this would be my sort of approach here. Um, another thing I'd be interested in, and again, it depends on what you've got available, um, a physiology pullback to see actually of all the diffuse area, can you actually get a good result treating one area without having to do both areas here? So they're, they're the two things that I'd be considering here in terms of you know how much to treat um, and, and what needs doing using imaging as a guide. Thanks, uh, those are excellent points. Uh, uh, Kokhan, how about yourself? Is this a radio straightforward case? Groin and uh, we have done the same guiding. I think the RCA, I always, uh felt that the RCA is something very, very, uh, we always uh, underestimate. So I actually very careful when I see an RCA. So in this situation, <clears throat> looking at the uh, the lesion that you have shown us, 
I, I would have actually used a much better support guide. I may actually go in with seven French. In this situation, because uh, I don't, I can't see very clearly from here, but if the calcification is quite uh, diffuse, I would go through femoral road because I might need to put in a temporary pacemaker if I'm going to do a rotablation. So this will be my consideration when I'm looking at the RCA that uh, you're showing me now. Would um, Dr. Beatrice, uh, would this case be something you'll do imaging up front or you'll do some form of attractomy based on the angiogram? Dr. Beatrice, uh, your mic is okay. Uh, still, we can't hear you very well, Dr. Beatrice, uh, with the microphone. So we'll go to Dr. Gaku. Um, Dr. Gaku? Yep. Uh, so the for the right coronary artery, I usually use IL, Icardi Deft catheter for this uh, kind of lesions. And uh, since this is, there's no branch for balloon anchoring, I think it's a good branch for the uh, balloon anchoring. So maybe I use IL uh, for, and, uh, for six French from radial and maybe in Japan we do imaging up front to see, what? I mean, both. I mean it can be OCT or it can be IVAS, but uh, if you are not used to uh, familiar to OCT, you can use IVAS as well. But uh, OCT, for calcified lesion is now, you know, better for to understand the location or distribution of the calcification. So, in calcified lesions, I personally use OCT for this kind of lesions. But the question is that whether you can cross the OCT catheter or not, and then crossability is less compared with IVAS. So that's the problem. Thank you, Doctor Beatrice. I see you rejoined. Uh... Any comments? Yeah, can, can you hear me now? Yes, uh, please go ahead. Perfect. No, only uh, in these cases, because the right is not really big, uh, maybe this, the GR is the correct cat catheter, but, uh, and, but sometimes when the wire is not crossing very well and you don't see very well the calcification, maybe with a micro could be good to pass the wire and then feel if there is a severe lesion or not, and try to do imaging to decide which plaque modification do you need for this lesion. Any other specific questions from the team in the care flag, Ma? Chitang and Idu? Anything mm. for the panel? Any questions? Yeah, before I let Mamad um, explain what, what his plan was, um, maybe just to pick up on some of the points. So, so they're all great points. Uh, we have, we have a, we should have mentioned, so we have a six French uh, system here. Uh, transradial uh, with a JR4 guide. Um, and actually when the guide uh, engages, actually there's a fair amount of uh, pressure damping. So I, you know, I, we, we take all the points about using a bigger um, size seven French guide, just in case we may need to uh, do some rotational atherectomy, et cetera. But um, in, in this case may, may be a little bit challenging. So uh, at the moment we've got a we've got a six French guide, as you can tell, it didn't sit very well. That's why we had to start putting a, a wire in just to, help support a little bit, but um, as mentioned, actually we, we do have other options. So we can anchor in that large um, kind of uh, conus branch if we require. So, um, you know, we, we, we still have options. Uh. So maybe Mohammed, you want to tell, yeah, you want to discuss your strategy? Yeah, so initially our strategy was to get a wire across and then we wanted to do some imaging and uh, we would choose IVERS for this case. Um, but unfortunately, um, the IVERS couldn't cross the, the, the lesion at the first run. So we had to um, pre-dilate with a 2 semi-compliant balloon first. So after pre-dilatation uh, up to uh, 10 and then approximately 14 atmospheres, we managed to cross uh, the IVERS catheter. And then uh, maybe I'll share the, uh, we go through the IVERS uh, images, images. Yep, so we have uh, Chiang with us and uh, to guide us through the, the IVERS shots. Actually, I think before this, the first IVERS run is, um, Proximal. proximal to the to the lesion where the um, where we couldn't cross the distal tip of the cat, IVERS catheter, but I, I don't know what what Chiang will show us. So maybe you can talk us through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I'm assuming you're okay. Again. So uh, we'll go through the uh, uh, IVERS pullback. So as, as you may have seen from the uh, uh, angle of the uh, where the IVERS catheter was, we are at the moment starting quite distal, very distal actually, almost into the uh, uh, PDA. 
So this is the distal part of the, uh, uh, the vessel. You can see that there's a quite diffuse um, disease, um, fibrocalcific. And it's uh, throughout, throughout the distal part of the RCA. Some parts like here, that's a little bit less plaque. Uh, but then, you know, it's, 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 uh, uh, that's the exception rather than the, than the norm. So it's really diffuse uh, disease uh, distally. Here we come to a relatively normal looking segment, and this is in the mid to distal uh, RCA um, area, which angiographically was uh, quite an appealing place uh, to perhaps finish our stenting or, or uh, aim for our distal stent edge. So anyway, so this is um, uh, that bit. Again, fibrous, uh, uh, fibrocalcific kind of plaque. Here we get some eccentric calcium in the seven to nine o'clock position. Uh, bear in mind, this is after a little bit of predilatation with the 2-0 uh, balloon. So we will see uh, some cracks um, uh, and some uh, small dissections. So although in the tight, this is the tight part of the uh, mid-RCA. So there is calcium, but there is, but it is not, I wouldn't say uh, more than uh, two quadrants, more than, uh, not, not more than 180 degrees. Um, so uh, not, not, not too heavily calcified, I guess, mostly eccentric calcium. Uh, this is towards the more proximal part. I think this is the uh, the, the next tightest uh, area in the proximal uh, RCA. The lumen is a little bit larger. There's a little bit more uh, calcium. It's a bit more concentric, but the lumen is bigger. And uh, all the way to the uh, very uh, proximal. So the guide in this run was uh, seated into the proximal RCA, so we don't see the uh, osteum of the RCA. Uh, I'll show you the next uh, run with the proximal in a, in a second. But this is just to show that all the way from proximal to mid RCA, really diffuse fibrocalcific um, disease. Um, the calcium uh, burden is, is thankfully not too bad. Um, there is a relatively healthy segment here for us to uh, finish our stenting. The distal reference is about 3.2 uh, millimeters. Distally, there is a lot of diffuse disease again with no, I guess, no real nice uh, spot to, uh, to, 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 to land a, a stent. So I'll just quickly show you the uh, proximal part of the RCA. So this is the proximal RCA, um, picking up from where we left off. So yeah, so a little bit of calcium, uh, sorry, a bit of dropout there, and then an uh, image comes back. And this is the ostium of the RCA. So some plaque um, at, just at the ostium, but, but you know, not, not too much. And uh, uh, relatively okay segment here, just where the conus branch takes off. So that's probably where we're going to try and aim for our proximal um, uh, landing zone. And the measurement here that I took earlier was about, uh, this is not a good place to do it. Uh, roughly was about three, three, five to four row. Yeah, about four row uh, at this point. Yeah. So yeah, so, so that's, that's, that's what we have. We have decent landing zones in the very proximal RCA. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to avoid the ostium and uh, in the mid to the still RCA. Thanks, uh, Chi Yang. Excellently uh, narrated once again. It's, it's actually very surprising to me how large the vessel was. Looking at your six French engagement, I think that's the power of imaging. Dr. Patel, you made a comment that you would have done some physiology to isolate the culprit and not to overdo this diffuse lesion. Looking at the IVUS, uh, is this good enough or do you think physiology has added value here? I think that the only reason for the physiology would be if you're going to get um, how far distal you're going to consider treating, I think, you know. So I think I'm, I'm happy with what I see on the IVUS there. It's just not clear to me how distal the IVUS went. Did it go all the way down into the um, uh, sort of into the PDA or, or was it was the landing zone? Um, so, so the physiology for me is really to guide if you're going to start doing anything with more distal. Uh, Chris, you you also seen the IVUS. Uh, do you think the two uh, balloon prep is good enough, or uh, you think you need artrectomy here or any other device preparation? Yeah, no. Actually, I'll be honest. Um, I thought it'd be a lot more calcified because I think when initially put cross, I mean, part of me was thinking what I'll do up front artrectomy, but I think it definitely needs a lot more lesion prep before you are going to implant anything further. But thankfully, at least the calcification isn't just that; isn't too bad. Only in the proximal section. Dr. Kaku, you, you, you must be an expert from Japan in imaging. Based yeah. on this very focal uh, 270 short range of calcium, what is the preferred uh, uh, 
lesion preparation technique here for you? I think, you know, if you, you, you don't have much experience of using rotabrator or OAS, maybe you can use, you go with just a cutting balloon or high pressure balloon for this lesion. But uh, if you are to modify calcification a little bit more, you can use shockwave balloon. And, uh, but, you know, you, you can just go with just high pressure plus uh, cutting balloon or something for this uh -huh. lesion. And then, why advice is not very good for the lot of blade. I mean, of course, you can ablate a little bit, but uh, the wire bias is a little bit closer to the normal healthy lesion. So maybe a slight risk of the perforation as well. So. so just to clarify, Dr. Kaku, you're suggesting that for this case in Japan, the practice is to uh, proceed with rotablation or you would go with a balloon first strategy? I mean, you can use both, and they, maybe the doctors are more aggressive. You can use a lot of later as well, but uh, yes. And then recently, we started using shockwave balloon as well. So maybe shockwave balloon is also one of the options because it is, this is, there's a eccentric calcite plaque. So maybe that's uh, better to use it. Thanks, Kaku. Yeah. The Kokan, uh, can you give us some of your own tips and tricks in the choice between the different type of balloon strategy? Why not just an NC balloon? How do you size the if balloons and uh, the difference between the different scoring balloons? Uh, for this <clears throat> yeah, I mean, just a quick question before that. I mean, during the run two, I was around frame uh, 1006, 1007. Uh, I see a lot of calcium on nearly, yeah, exactly somewhere around here. If, if I may ask, are we seeing a calcium nodule here or you think it's just calcium? I think it's difficult to distinguish between calcium nodule versus a sheet of calcification by IBUS. But uh, maybe there are some calcium nodules, but uh, most likely those calciums are seed of calcium. Just Chi, me, Chi Yang, yeah, any yeah. any guidance on how do you tell? Oh. Maybe you look at this image frame here. Yeah, the, the one that yeah. has a blackout. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with uh, our um, uh, Japanese colleague that it's it's more difficult to tell on uh, IVUS than uh, uh, on OCT. Um, the, the, the typical appearance of a calcified nodule is usually that it protrudes uh, into the lumen. Um, it's got a, an irregular kind of surface. Uh, usually with a signal dropout um, be behind it, uh, even on uh, OCT because of the presence of uh, thrombus or fibrin on top of the uh, uh, calcium uh, spicules. Um, here, I, th I think uh, you know, it'd be hard to, uh, to, <laughs> to, to know for sure, um, but just, I don't know, just from pattern recognition, I, I would think this is not, um, not so typical of a, a calcium nodule uh, and more, more just uh, you know, calcium that is... Uh, Grown into the grown into the lumen, Doctor Beatrice. Does it really matter to you? Will you just go and dilate and see whether it opens, whether you think it's calcium or calcium nodule? Well, in my opinion, seeing the ibus, there is a moderate calcified lesions in the more severe part. Uh, so, the problem you don't have a lot of uh, guide support because it's a small artery. Maybe I, I pass a second wire, a high support wire, maybe uh, extra support Sion blue wire, and then try to predilate with a cutting balloon. I think the Wolverine is navigating very well. So try to open with a cutting balloon will be enough because uh, by IBUS is more moderate calcification, more than severe. This is my, my opinion. Thanks maybe a lot go for back. all the suggestions. Jack, maybe I can tell you where- Yes, where, yes. Where we, we're just gonna- about. Move on a little bit because the, the we, we don't want to keep the patient here too long. So um so so we totally agree we need a bit more lesion prep. So we've decided to go with some scoring. Uh we, we don't we have chosen not to go up front with the rotor at the present time. So you can see this balloon um passes, it's not 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 the smoothest, so that just shows really that there is um quite a fair amount of calcium there. And we've chosen a scoring balloon. Uh Mohammed, you wanna mention what balloon we've yes. uh, chosen? So using the scrofex trio. Which is uh, supposed to have three areas where you can score from the two scoring wires and one uh, wire. So it's actually an uh, upgrade from uh, the previous version of Scoreflex. 
think uh, Chiang has a fair amount of experience with this. So Chiang, you want to just explain a bit more about this? Yeah. So so this is the this is a new balloon from uh, uh Orbis. Uh, like the moment said, it's an upgrade of the uh NC Score Flex, which I think most of us are familiar with. So the NC Score Flex balloon, um, there is a, a a short I guess monorail kind of thing, and you have an integral wire, uh, outside of the uh, balloon. Uh, so when you go up with the balloon, this integral wire gets pressed against the uh, uh, the plug along with your guide wire. So you have two, you have kind of like two wires pressing against the plug with the NC score flex. With the NC score flex trio, T R I O, there are two integral wires, and those two plus your guide wire uh, gives rise to a uh, three cuts. Uh, so supposedly, um, you know, gives you a more more circumferential, I guess, uh, cuts. You get cuts at 120 degree separation rather than uh, at 180 degree separation. The uh, cross crossing profile of the balloon is not compromised by the uh, additional integral wire because they've uh, minimized or, or uh, miniaturized, you like the, uh, the the size of the integral wire. So the uh, crossing profile is uh, is uh, preserved. Um, so it's it's quite a quite a quite a uh, an easy balloon to use. You can see um, it, it's expanded pretty well. Um, yeah, and, and and you know for those who like scoring balloons. Um, this is certainly, uh, uh, I would say, a, 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 an upgrade. Yeah. So, so I mean, with scoring, um, you know, you, you go up a bit slow just to make sure that the scoring elements dig into the plug. Yeah. And then with this kind of um, NC non-compliant system, you can actually um, also use the higher pressures to you know further optimize your your cracking. Yeah. So, so that's a it's a nice kind of marriage between uh, these two technologies. Uh, Chitang, uh, this is what size, and if you're using a uh, score flex versus a Wolverine, based on the imaging, is there any sizing tips and tricks uh, between the different scoring balloons? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think we've gone um, with a 275 uh, at the moment. Um, I think uh, normally we wouldn't, we wouldn't go more than... Would you go one to one with a trio scoring balloon, Chitang or Chiyang? Uh, Okay, honestly, this is the first time I've using, I'm using the trio, but with a normal scoring balloon, I would, um, yeah, norm, most of the time, wouldn't go one is to one. Right? Because, I mean, the, the concept is really just to get those cracks. You don't really need to, to um, use it to so-called dilate. Um, but, I mean, in theory, it, there shouldn't be much penalty if you want to go one is to one. Kohan, is that what you do as well for, let's say, you use an NC balloon versus a Wolverine? Is that a... Yeah, you what should go sizing? half size smaller. If I think it's a 3 0 vessel, I will go half, half size smaller by 275. Uh, I think I agree with you. I think we are just trying to open up the crack. Uh, and and <clears throat> extra force may actually end up impinging on the softer side of the plug and cause perforation. So I usually go about half size smaller. So distally, it looks like a 3 0 vessel. Uh, most of the guys here will use a 275. Dr. Patel, is that what you advise as well? Or Chris? Yeah, I probably would do the same just because I've been bitten before. <laughs> uh, doc, Dr. Gaku, if you're using an NC balloon, will you just go with a 3 or 275 as well? Maybe 3 is okay because based on the vessel size by IBUS, but in this case, there's an eccentric cost of the plug, which is one of the risk factors of uh, Basic perforation, so, so two seven five is safer for this in this situation. But if the uh, yeah, because uh, black is concentric, maybe you can go with the three O as well. Thanks, so Kaku. So it's very nice to watch him do everything live, uh, video. Now we're looking at the uh, Ivers uh, Chiang. You want to take us through? Yeah. So this the Ivers pullback after um, uh, the uh, two seven five uh, NC Scoreflex trio. So we can see that there are some cracks here in the uh, calcium. Uh, the lumen is uh, appreciably uh, bigger than before um, the uh, le lesion preparation. You see some uh, dissections, uh, which we expect to see after a balloon dilatation. This is a live pullback, so I can't pause the, uh, the image to show you, but I thought I saw um, some uh, cracks um, there uh, earlier. So later, maybe we can go through it uh, a little bit more slowly. But this is, uh, again, uh, pulling back. The, the I, I think there's uh, adequate um, lumen gain and uh, I see enough cracks for, for us to be quite confident 
uh, with the stand deployment. So anyway, let's let's go back again. Yeah. So again, so yeah, you can see there's some so the guy wires over here. We can see a crack um, over here on this uh, 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 seven or eight uh, o'clock position from the calcium there. That's is this the same nice. point that Kokan was concerned about on my rating too? Huh? Is it the same? Uh, no, no, that was more towards the mid part. Uh, this is a little bit more distal than that. So Here, we continue to see the calcium, some cracks there. And yeah. just now the balloon opened quite well from what I saw. Uh, Chitang, if you agree. And, yeah. and would you ask for more lesion preparation here? Yeah, interested to hear what the panel thinks. I mean, angiographically, you can see it has uh, certainly looks bigger. Um, we've got some angiographically, you can see some of the dissection already, which is, which is good. Um, do we need to do more? Um, I, so maybe I go around quickly. Uh, Dr. Patrice, uh, would you upsize the balloon? And uh, where will you stand to? I think is is really enough because when you see the balloon open, the balloon open very well. The balloon is not really undersized; is is quite uh, similar to the vessel. So I don't delay it more. Uh, it's only to decide to use draculotin balloon, maybe because it's really really diffuse disease and low lesion. But there is some areas of dissection, so maybe a stain is better because we have a really good stains nowadays. But to me, is the question draculotin balloon versus a stand in diffuse lung disease? Excellent uh, question, actually. I will ask around the rest of the panel. Uh, Dr. Gaku, would you have any experience with a DCB here? So, in Japan, actually, the percent, percentage of using DCB alone without stenting is increasing, actually. And then, so if you have good lesion preparation, good lumen size, then some of the doctors tend to use drug coated balloon instead of standing. But uh, in this case, uh, I think the vessel medial tear uh, by balloon angioplasty is uh, severe. So I prefer to use standing, I mean, for this lesion. But uh, we have a lot of experience using DCB alone without standing. Yeah, imaging is very important to assess where you can go with DCB or stenting. And uh, Dr. Kaku always emphasized on the medial tear for risk of closure. Yeah. Uh, Kohan, in Malaysia, I know you guys use a ton of DCB. Is yeah. this a good case for long segment DCB therapy to spare a stent? Uh, not in the mid segment where I see a lot of calcium in the imaging. I think calcium plus a lot of dissection. Uh, I won't be very comfortable sleeping at night. So I, I may still want to put a stand at where the calcified uh, area with the dissection, but distally, uh, maybe I may just uh, try to get away with just a DCB yeah, in, this, in this patient. But if I may ask the operator a quick question, why you choose a scoring balloon instead of worry? Uh, instead of cutting balloon, uh, actually, I was also worried about the possibility uh, because my guy doesn't give me much support and I had even resistance, you know, uh, getting the, the IVS in the first time around. And even the tour balloon, there was just a little bit gritty. So I, I, I was concerned that uh, cutting balloon and Wolverine might, might like, get caught up. Uh. So uh, my experience with Coflex is that it's low profile, uh, usually crosses better than a Wolverine kind of a cutting balloon. Um, yeah, so that's, that's uh, the decision. But, but I mean, it's a good point. Um, I, I think, yeah, we will, we, we will never know. Lah, because we never pulled out the, the cutting to try and pass it down. Yeah. So can, can I get some uh, maybe tips and tricks on uh, DCB here? Uh, Chris, do you have any uh, tips about when you should cross over to stenting if the primary approach of DCB initially? I think clearly if there's a flow limiting dissection, I think that's the most obvious indication for stenting. But I agree with, I think the initial strategy from the operators is that I think I'll probably land a stent somewhere in the 60 mm mark thereabouts. And I think distally, I probably wouldn't go any further and most the DCB. Dr. Beatrice, would you DCB this case and you mentioned it to start? 
I think more and more in Europe, we are using more DCD for this kind of diffuse disease, but it's true that calcification, we don't know how the drug is going to this uh, calcification. So I'm not sure about the efficacy in that specific case, but for diffuse disease, we use more and more DCB, more than dracolutin stain. And all the companies now have a dracolutin balloon, uh, at least the, the most important companies. So we are going to see more cases using dracolutin balloon more than a stain in the future, I think so. Thanks, Dr. Beatrice. Uh, actually, Chiteng and uh, Idu, I know from all the hesitation, we're quite used to stenting, but I think this case, there is a use case for DCB. You had very good uh, lesion expansion. You do not have a flow limiting dissection. When you dilate, you're meant to see dissections anyway. And your MSA post uh, lesion prep was actually quite reasonable. I think you achieved quite good lesion sizing. So I, I think DCB is worth a consideration and a try if you want to avoid stents for this mm. particular patient. Uh, back to you, let, let us know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I think I think that's a great point. Um, I mean, of course, when we started out, um, we had reservations about how the the vessel would react because with uh, all the calcium, and it is pleasantly surprising that uh, we've got quite a lot of lumen gain with uh, with the balloon dilatation. So I, I I totally agree that DCB is a is an option here. I think my personal reservation, I don't know about Muhammad, is that. It's, it's going to be a fairly long segment, well, very long segment. So whether we're going to have two overlapping DCBs or some kind of hybrid approach, um, uh, that's certainly possible. But you know, at the back of my mind is also wondering about um, what additional benefit would there be as compared to if we put in two overlapping stents. Uh? So uh, I think for a younger patient, maybe there is, an, uh, there is a case to argue for not caging the, uh, the artery at, at, a, at a young age. Um, this gentleman is 76, so uh, maybe that doesn't apply so much to him, but uh, that, that, that could just be me being a little bit ageist. Uh. So I, I don't know what Muhammad's <laughs> thoughts are about so this. So maybe just a quick ask, uh, Chiteng and Muhammad. Uh, 76, HB9, moderate to high bleeding risk patient. Will you think it's equivalent between using a... Uh, one month or shorten DAPD versus a DCB approach. Uh, would that yeah. also factor in any? I, I think it's uh, equivalent because the short depth stance, uh, if you can tolerate one month and this gentleman doesn't have active bleeding, uh, you, you could choose a short depth stance here or DAB. And in this case, because of long segment uh, diabetes, uh, I prefer a stance and knowing that actually the size of the vessel is actually much bigger with the stand when we post dilate, we can actually go pretty uh, big, especially proximally. I think angiogra angiographically, the outcome, it would, it would look better uh, if we go with the stand. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's a great point that you brought up, Jack. Um, and and I, I think maybe, I don't know whether it was a kind of like a trap or a trick question, but as you know, there is actually no good data in, um, you know, for, to, to guide the APT duration, DCB, high bleeding risk. So, so we can't be totally sure that... Um, it's, it's any much more safer than if we had put in one of these stents that have been tested specifically in a high bleeding risk uh, population. So mm. we'll go with you, Chiteng. Yeah. Well, Muhammad, Muhammad is the boss yeah. here. So, um, so, so I'm, we're thinking when we measure from divers, we need about 70 mm of stents. So uh, two long stents. And uh, the distal, uh, the mid to distal area, where our landing zone is actually around three, uh, three mm uh, in size. So initially we're thinking whether to go with a 275 and, and, and then go up with a 3 or up front go with a 30. I think it's probably better to go with a 3038 uh, distally first, then we'll use the stand to, to, to measure. Yeah, so we're gonna choose the, the Onyx uh, uh, Frontier, which is uh, I think the next generation uh, Onyx stands. Uh, it's also a short, uh, short, a short depth stand, uh, similar to the uh, Resolute Onyx and um, yeah, and it's supposed to have a lower profile, so more possibility. Um, let's put it to the test then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think this would be a good, good, good stand choice. I mean, as uh, Muhammad says, we have data from uh, Onyx One about uh, you know with regard to its use in a patient population that is pretty much what our patient is, right? Elderly, HB less than ten. Uh, you know that trial shows very clearly that uh, it is no worse than. Um, 
and the, uh, the other stands that have been uh, have been tested in this um, in this sphere when compared to a bare metal stand, which used to be the standard of care. And um, we also shown how um, actually we this is not this vessel. We've talked a little bit about it. It's not so straightforward. So wow, okay. So it's just kind of sailed right across. Even as I was trying to build up the the story. Okay. So small tests. Okay, so this is good that we have a first use uh, case in Singapore for a trio as well as a yeah. yeah if I really Onyx sailed and... across there, yeah. I think Muhammad skill uh, probably. Okay, looks good. Looks good. Yeah, I think we have enough length. Yeah, yeah, looks looks nice. And uh, we actually didn't want to overlap too much inside uh, at that tight lesion area, and and we managed to uh, miss that area. That's good. So. Okay, so we are going to nominal, which is 12. Opens up quite nicely, actually. Can you see me again, just to see the expansion? So actually, one of the reasons of choosing DCB alone is uh, you don't have any landing zone for the stenting, for stenting. And then in this case, I think, like you guys said, I, I think there's a good landing zone, health, relatively healthy region to land. So maybe, you know, stent for this case is good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Because yeah. we had such a such a juicy spot there. Yes, and, yes. Oh, yeah, we got tempted by it, and uh, you know, we, we we fell to temptation. So uh, yeah, our not so great. You want to measure with? Yeah, yeah. Hold on, hold on. So I haven't included it yet. Yeah, yeah. Around that, yeah, see, right. Yeah. yeah, around that branch, right? Okay, see. Can use this much shorter. Yeah. Usually at this stage, I, I do put in the ivers again just to use the ivers to mark the length of the stand if you're standing. Ah. Really, yeah. But you, you have decided to put in another stand? Yes, yes, yes. That, that is our intent. Two overlapping stands. Probably three, five approximately. This is quite long. Yeah, I think the, the, the ostium is like four rows, so I think three five would be great. Then we can um we can uh adjust uh, accordingly to get as much gain as we dare. Yeah. Are, you, are you going to put in a stand now or Ivers? So um I mean yeah, we can why, why don't we take a shot first just to make sure there are no surprises? Okay. Yeah, let me get a little bit better. Okay, here. Why you no need to do now? So, so uh, Jack, you would put uh, Ivers down for more precise um, measure, uh, for more precise sizing line in terms of the length. Is no, the, usually the, I, oh, I just okay. use it for length. So I, I just put it down. I mark the ah, proximal okay. stand edge all the way to the ostium. Then I just give it 2 mm or 3 mm buffer and and I, I, see, I, I just see. overlap and go up. I don't I don't shoot anymore. Okay. Uh, one okay. way to minimize contrast. Okay. A any other any other folks would okay. then now go with uh, hybrid DCB approximately or should you just stand it? We have a measurement at the start of the one. We'll take your suggestions so we we'll use the IVS to measure. Yep. Just, uh, so we have more precision since we've already opened it up. This is a good test for our normal wire measurement, okay? Because if you look at this, it's our initial wire measurement. It's about 30. So the prediction would be that this is probably going to take about a 30. So let's see. Let's see. Because, okay. you know, a lot of times, um, I mean, not a lot of times, but sometimes we don't use the IVUS, right? So, yeah. And the IVUS crosses the stands no, 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 now. No. Um, Kohan, any uh, tips if you not using Ivers and you want to precisely stand the ostium? Uh, what I usually do is uh, when I pass down the stand just now, I will just sort of park it at the proximal to measure it and then take a CD to place the location yeah, before I push down. So I use the first stand as a measurement. <laughs> okay. okay um, I think this is not... Uh, you know, as always, on live, they like to uh, make things a little bit more challenging. Mm. I think the uh, nose cone is a bit abutting a little bit on the stented area. 
we haven't really post dilated this stand very much, uh, apart from using the stand balloon. There's probably an eccentric calcium there. That yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, so that's right. quite common. Yeah. So it, it might also prevent yeah. your stand from going down smoothly. Uh, yes. Depending on the stand. Depends. Okay, so I think maybe we will uh, we will um, we'll dilate this. about this stand. Um, shall we you try with the stand? We can test you the stand. Want to challenge with the stand. So uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You it's were thinking of a 30 mm, but I was thinking I think more so. 34 I think four to give you a bit five, of buffer. 34? Uh, do we need 34? Okay. Let's see. Uh, yeah, we have the, uh, yeah, that one. This one, right? 34 seems generous. Uh. A bit too generous. Yeah, I agree. Too yeah. long. Too long. Oh, this is 38. Uh, right? Actually, uh, it might be okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, actually, okay. I think 30 should be okay. Um, yeah, I, I think any, 30, 30. Any advice? Beatrice. Are you uh, going to stand to the ostium? You might need a bit. No, no. We want to stand to where that, uh, you, you saw that corners branch. But if I'm not mistaken, your iris also show the ostium also got lesion, right? Mm, not, not really, you know. Uh, we believe the iris shows that the ostium is quite, I mean, there's a bit of plug, but not, not horrendous. Yeah. Sure. yeah. That means you're going to stand and land it on a plug. Mm, okay, we think you there is a spot. Okay, we think there is a spot after the um slightly distal to the um to that uh what do you call it? Yeah, what somewhere is, around here. Okay, this this part the ivers can can reach, so we can show you. So, uh, Chitang, I'm going to give you an extra 10 minutes of air time before we go to Dr. Beatrice. Oh, okay, okay, can, can, no problem, no problem. Uh, so, you decide whether it's showing us on either pre-dilating yep. or delivering yep. the stand. Okay. So, so let's, let's do this. We're going to quickly put in the IVERS. We just confirm that the ostium we can... Okay, enough. We will confirm that we can leave the ostium alone. Okay. You want to disengage your guide? Yeah. <clears throat> yep. okay. This is for Kohan's benefit. Let's see uh, whether... No, 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 it's important, actually. It is important. Uh, do you want to do a manual? Oh, you haven't? Uh, okay. Le, 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 no, I just pressed... Sorry, I thought you activated the pull. Uh. Okay, this is pulling back from that... Um, yeah, so... I mean, looks... You look... You think it's okay, the, the, the austere area? Kokan or Chiyang? I, I think the one frame that is a bit clear, but I think it's actually got plaque. No, it's it's got a small amount of plaque. Um, but I think the uh, risk of sticking it up, yeah, yeah, it's not worth uh, covering this amount of plaque. Uh, so I, I would recommend uh, going aiming for that branch. Oh, okay, give me a three five thirty. So th this is this is the branch nine o'clock, and that's the aorta out here. So this is. You know, there's a small amount of plug up there. Uh, I I don't think it's worth. Uh, mm -hmm. you, can't, by, you can't cover it without sticking your stand into the aorta. Cost. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, sorry. Uh, we we take all the points, but we will. Uh, we we're gonna try to uh, spare the the ostium. Hopefully, we don't regret <laughs> this move. <laughs> so three five thirty. And if it doesn't, um, if it knocks against the other stand, then we will post dilate a bit. Yeah. For well, this type of wire bias, sometimes really a body wire is very good. Okay, there. Okay, so no the problem. frontier stand is excellent. Very good. Okay, so come back a little bit. Yeah. Okay, okay, see. Make sure it's open now. Yep, plenty of it. You can come back a bit more, I think. Come back a bit more. Uh, probably I have to come back at least two mm -hmm. mm more, I think. Yep, yep. Maybe the 34 uh, was good. a better idea. Huh? Okay, okay, see uh, Oh, I, I think it's good. There's still quite good overlap. Oh, uh, ostium ready. Ostium ready. <laughs> uh, uh, is your okay, stance okay. overlap? If your stance overlap, uh, this yeah. may be good too. Uh, yeah, okay, we then. just and go in. Half, half. Oh, no, I, I think this looks very good, you know. I, I huh? like this. Okay, like okay. This. You like this? You like this? Okay, one more time, one more time. Vicini, just to make sure everything is still saying. Yeah, I, I prefer to go in a little bit so that we don't have any sticky out thing. Yeah, thing. yeah just, just a little bit. Yeah. 
I think this will cover the. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, here, yeah, yeah, okay, sitting here, yeah. Uh, anyone we comment, Chris or Beatrice? Is this okay? Yeah, I think it's perfect. And sometimes if you have a STEM boost, okay. it's also perfect to see you are overlapping very well. Okay, it is to 12. Down. I think your 30 mm is just nice, uh, Chitain. Uh, okay, we push it down a little bit just to uh, get the overlap done properly. 16. Yeah, that's too long. Yeah. Okay, down. Then we flare a little bit because I think the ostium is uh, four row, right? So we shouldn't be injuring it too much. So Chitang, after this, uh, you give us an angel, then we'll drop off for a lecture. We'll come back for your final optimization and Ivers, if it's okay. Okay. Yep. Great. Okay. 16 down. So we just need to push dilate, right? Yeah, he wants a picture. Slide. Slide, 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 slide. Okay, see it. Wow. <laughs> okay. 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 Decent. okay. Okay, Ken, we will uh, do a bit of plastic surgery to this, make it look a bit nicer, and then uh, we'll catch up with you later, okay? Yeah, that'd be great. It's already, okay. already looking very good. Thanks, uh, Chitang, Chiyang, and uh, Idu. So we'll have the Cath Lab stop share. Then uh, Dr. Beatrice is going to take us through some other cases of challenging crossing lesions. Dr. Beatrice, please. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm going to share the screen. Can you see my, my slides? Yes, please uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, before to start uh, presenting some cases, I, I want to say that I think we have several techniques to increase the guide catheter support uh, in this scenario to treat distal lesions or tortuous, uh, or tortuous segments before to distal lesions. We have active support, passive support, body wire, more and more we are using guide extension catheters and in the past we use more anchor techniques. I think these techniques can also be used in combination and it's not less important that if we have calcification before all these techniques or in combination, optimal plaque modification is really important. And also it's important to check your materials, your balloons and your dry clothing stain characteristics because in these kind of lesions, you need a lot of pushability and deliberty of the balloons and stands. So this is the first case that was a 70 years old male with a lot of risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and former smoker. The patient in 2022 had acute coronary syndrome and a stain was placed in the left circumflex. And that patient has a CTO of the right coronary artery. That patient was referred uh, for ephora angina you can see the renal fennel was normal and the ventricular function also was preserved. This is the first, uh, the first lateral STEMI. You can see the circumflex was occluded here. And also you can see some collateral circulation to the right coronary artery. We pass the CM wire to the circumflex and you can see that was a severe bend comparing to the left main to the circumflex. And we have some problems to, to pass some small balloons. So we use a body wire technique that means to pass a second wire and advance an onyx frontier that was easily implanted. Uh, this is the final result after post dilatation. So this is the first technique using high support technique as using body wire. It gives only mild to moderate support. We use uh, more uh, in Europe, Sion Blue extra support, more than BHW or Grand Slam, but these wires are really supporting wires. The same case we have 
also the passive support. The passive support that means using bigger French and also the, the shape of the curve of the guiding catheter could be amplified that give more support and also using anchor, anchor technique, placing a balloon in the atrial branch in the right coronary artery because it was already calcified a tortuous CTO of the right coronary artery. So when we talk about active and passive support, the active uh, support we don't use too much because there is a risk of dissection if you engage the catheter deep of inside of the artery. In that cases, we use more and more guide extension catheters that is safe. Passive support, that means using bigger uh, guiding French catheters or extra backup uh, guiding catheters, the shape giving more support to you. So in that case, we, thanks to the guiding support catheter and the anchoring, we predilated the distal lesion, the mid lesion. But then we, when we tried to advance the cutting balloon was not possible. So we are used a seven French telescope to advance a cutting balloon to predilate the distal lesions. And then we implant a big stand, a long stand, the Onyx Frontier 4 to 34. So now in Europe, we have a lot of guide extension catheters. I have experience with guide liner, Godzilla, and telescope. I don't have too much experience with Gideon. I think both of them are similar to me. Guide liner and telescope are really similar. Maybe Godzilla has a little bit more inner space and is more flexible. Maybe it's better for tortoise lesions, but guy liner and telescope are really strong and have good support for right coronary artery. So here in detail, the telescope, I think the most important of this catheter is the distal part is really soft, so it's not really dangerous for the artery. So this is the final result of that case. As you see, the distal, in, when I treat CTO lesions, I prefer not to touch the distal part of the lesion. I prefer to take the patient in six months and see what happened for these distal lesions. So this is the second case. The second case is a 79-year-old male, also with a lot of risk factor. The patient has hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, obesity, and also had a chronic kidney disease with a, with a EGFR of 50. And that patient was admitted for inferior STEMI. This is the left side. The left side was a diffuse disease, calcified lesions. You can see uh, a small collateral circulation to the right coronary artery. You can see the LAD with a diffuse disease. So you can see here the right coronary artery. There was a really big bend in the proximal right coronary artery. And you can see at the middle distal lesion, you can see a tight lesion. And after that lesion, you can see an image uh, that was compatible with thrombus. So I tried to advance uh, uh, thrombus aspiration, but, but because it was not possible, uh, I had passive support with the Amplage left one seven French by radial approach. I use a Sion Blue extra support wire, but despite of that, the, the thrombus aspiration did cross the first curve. So I decided to predilect with a small balloon, and then you can see that there was a lot of uh, thrombus. There, there was a, a moderate calcification in the mid-distal part, but also was a really tight lesion in the origin of the PL. So here I use a guide extension catheter to advance the cutting balloon to treat the distal lesion. You can see here that was well open. Before the cutting, I used no compliant balloon that was not well open. So then I advance the distal stand. You can see here the onyx frontier that advanced easily to the lesion that was prepared before a cutting balloon. They are implanting a second frontier in the mid-distal part, also helping with a, with a guide extension catheter. Then I postulated all the stand were not overlapped stands. And you can see here the final result. I think 
that the, the new uh, Onyx Frontier didn't change the stand, didn't change the polymer, also didn't change the drag. The only thing that they changed that I think is really helpful, they increased the flexibility of the catheter and also they modified the balloon that increased the lower crossing profile. So I'm not engineer, but I feel that this stand is, is quite competitive in terms of delivery. I'm not sure if it's better. They, they told us that yes, but I'm not, uh, I'm not sure 100%, but I feel that I'm not sure it is better than the old one, but in, I feel that in that kind of tortuosity, distal lesions is a really good, good stand. So this is the last case, is a 74 years old mare with a hypertension, diabetic, dyslipidemia. That patient had a moderate to severe COPD and also has a peripheral disease artery and is a pan vascular. So the patient has a chronic ischemic heart disease with unstable angina in 2005 that was implanted in a drug gluten stand in the marginal brand. We controlled that patient in 2013 because of an effort angina and the stand was patterned, but there was a moderate lesion in the LED and right coronary artery that FFR was negative, but the patient currently was admitted because of an unstable angina. The ejection fraction was preserved. You can see here the right coronary artery, the LED was similar, but the right coronary artery, you can see the aorta that was severe calcification in the aorta and in the distal part was a severe calcification. I tried to advance a small balloon, but that was an uncrossable lesion. So I used 7 French AL 075 radial approach, that uncrossable lesion, so I used rota. First 125, after that 15 bar size was a floppy wire. I changed the wire through a fine cross catheter. So then the balloon, I tried to advance a cutting balloon, but it was not possible is the reason I use a guide extension catheter to advance a cutting balloon. But you can see here, the cutting balloon was not well open. So I use a little plastic balloon that was a three millimeter 12 balloon that was well open. And then I advance an onyx frontier to the distal part. I use IBUS to decide which part I treat because there was a diffuse disease. So we implant this stand. And you can see here the result that was quite good because it was a really diffuse uh, uh, right coronary artery. So this is my uh, how I overcame problematic distal lesions. I tried to increase my guide support using passive support. That means that bigger French, seven, seven usually, I don't use too much A French, only sometimes for the right coronary artery. And for the right, I use EL. For the left, I use EBU because I think from Medtronic, they give good support. I use uh, body wires, but they give only you mild to moderate support. I use Sion, uh, extra support Sion wire. Uh, anchor technique I use more in the past, and now I use more guide extension catheters. I know very well guide liner, telescope, and Godzilla. And I think also it's important to check your material when you, you, when you treat these kind of lesions, because you need high delivery of balloons or stents, lower crossing profile and high visibility. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Patrice. Uh, indeed, a very complimentary lecture to Dr. Patel's uh, lecture as well. Um, any comments from the panel regarding the lecture, uh, starting from Chris? Yeah, no, I mean, because I actually haven't had the experience to use the Onyx Frontier yet, but to see this, the stand slide through in uh, Dr. Beatrice's cases, they're very nice, I have to say. So maybe when they do come over, we'll have a try as well. But very impressive. Um, the Medtronic engineer is still here. Uh, Dr. Balakrishnan, is she around? Sorry, Dr. Jack, she has already dealt, uh, locked off. Okay. From what I understand, like what Dr. Beatrice alluded to is that the stand architecture is no different from the onyx it's just the balloon and the guiding platform is refined so that it's easier to deliver they have do a dual layer so that it's thinner and therefore the cream down profile is uh, smaller 
So indeed, it does look quite impressive. Uh, Kohan, any comments on the lecture? Yeah, I think it's a fantastic uh, lecture. <clears throat> but I think I have one question is like, you, 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 you did mention that body wire only give uh, moderate um, support. So um, beside <clears throat> using it in vessel where you actually have a lot of branches, uh, is there any tips and tricks to, to make sure that um, it, it actually gives us more support than what you have mentioned? Uh, sorry, I, I don't understand the question. <clears throat> so um, so you, 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 in your lecture, you tell us that the body wire technique that you have shared with us uh, only can provide a moderate uh, support uh, at best. So my question is, uh, is there any tips that you can share with us, like where to put the wire uh, or, or maybe even angling technique that actually can improve the, the support? Yes, I usually use a, a really high support wire, the first one, and the second is not a high support wire. Uh, and sometimes, because if there is calcification, you only need to change the bias of the wires to advance the material. So it helps you a lot because sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a thing of support and sometimes is the tortuosity. And to pass the bends with the second wire helps you a lot. I didn't give three wires, but now, because we have a lot of guide extension catheter, in fact, I use more these guide extension catheters and I don't use too much um, anchoring balloon. I use two wires always first to try because it's fast, but the anchoring balloon, uh, because it's not compatible uh, with uh, the guide extension, I choose one or the other, so I prefer to use more and more guide extension catheters. Thanks, thanks. Uh, Dr. Kaku, do you have any experience in or further tips and tricks using body wires actually, and or so, wiggle wire? Yeah, actually the, the first option I said, I said that it was a uh, guide extension, but uh, before that, you should try body wire as well, always, I think. And then if it, it doesn't cross, then you use guide extension. So body wire is the first choice, actually. So it's good. And then like uh like like everybody says that support wire is feasible to use the body wire technique so i agree with and and your anchor balloon would be after body wire fail after guiding support fail then anchor is that your algorithm now actually First, we try, I mean, I try body wire and the guide extension. And then next step would be like a anchor balloon technique because anchor balloon technique, maybe you, you can injure the vessel by balloon inflation to healthy locations. So maybe guide extension is better to try it before you try uh, anchor balloon technique. And uh, failing which you go for some sort of debulking or tractomy before you try further, or so it depends. If there's a calcification, then and then you try lot of later or debulking devices, and then but the uncross reason is just bending or tortuosity. Then you may choose other option like a mother child catheter technique deep engagement of guide extension catheter, something like that. Thank you. A any final comments on Dr. Beatrice before we go back to the care lab? Yeah, only I wanted to, to, to have your experience uh, comparing the different uh, guide extension catheter. What is your experience using Godzilla or telescope or guideliner because First, we only have one in, in Europe that was guideliner, but we, we now have more and more. And sometimes it's difficult to choose one or the other. And I wanted to know your experience in that sense and which size you use usually, six, six French, seven French. Um, Kohan, you want to take this one or I can? I, mean, I just have a quick comment. Um, Godzilla, I, I use more Godzilla, but it also depends on the guide catheter. Um, <clears throat> for example, the Cordis guide catheter, although it's six French, 
but it can't accommodate the guideline. Uh, while a launcher six French guide seems to be able to accommodate the guideline. Uh, so that also depends on what guide you're using. Yeah. So yeah, that's just a very quick comment, Jack. Uh, Chris, do you have any preference for that? Sorry, I missed the part earlier. I had to take a call. Uh, no, no problem. So basically, there are so many guide extensions out there. You have Liquid Boost Telescope. Godzilla guideliner is, is I, I get confused, right? So there, there are different characteristics. Uh, more importantly is the ID and the lubricity. I think some of them are pretty soft. So if I think I'm trying to track a more tortuous one, I would go with usually a boost or one of those guide plus where it's a bit more lubricious but quite soft. And the internal diameter is not my concern. I just want to be able to balloon rail and track it distally. And the rest of the more proximal, a bit more proximal type, I think none of them matters. If you're using it to deliver, for example, a cover stand, or you're using it in a dire situation where you need a larger ID, clearly the largest ID one would be Godzilla. So it gives you a slightly larger uh, uh, internal diameter to deliver what you need. Uh, between six and seven French, I, I think the pushability is not as important as whether it's crossable and trackable. So a, a larger uh, guide extension, I only use it if I want to put a 1.25 rotor blader through it. Uh, otherwise, I, I generally just use six French. Dr. Gaku, do you have any final comments on the different guide extension? No, I, I mean, like, I mean, I agree with your opinion. And then we have also guide plus, uh, the, the, the other guide extension calendar name, Guide Plus in Japan. So we actually Guide Plus is the most popular guide extension catheter in Japan, and it it, uh, it has larger in diameter. So you know, larger in diameter, it's important. Thank you very much. Yeah. So the the Guide Plus is uh, sometimes useful because it's also quite lubricious. Uh, then of course some of the imaging catheter, right? The tip you can potentially do it for osteo. Uh, OCT or IVERS because you can yes. see through it. Uh, yep. So those one or two, I think telescope potentially you can do that. Yeah, telescope is good for that. I mean, maybe first three millimeter they don't have any wire, so you can image uh, osteal lesion, and the, for that reason we use also teles telescope for that reason. But much. frankly, Doctor Beatrice, not much difference. Huh? I think uh, as long as you're using the technique. Properly, I think quite minute, marginal. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So we'll go back to the Kev Lab. Uh, can you share screen from the Kev Lab? I think the operators are looking very relaxed now. So maybe we share screen from the Kev Lab and uh, unmute them and see whether they can tell us what, what we've done. Chitang and Idu, you're back. Okay. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Okay. So uh, where we left off, we actually centered the, the distal part of the RCA with a trio by a 38 uh, frontier stand. And then after that, we wanted to, to do an IVERS, but the IVERS couldn't pass through because of the angles. And then we had this uh, discussion on whether we can just base on a wire and estimate within the second stand without, without a post dilatation. So we opted for the latter and we used a, a trio, 35 by 30 uh, frontier stand and actually went through uh, quite easily and managed to overlap. And then we had some length and then we, we decided that we're going to cover the ostium. So we pull it back and we, we covered the ostium and then we deployed the, the stent. Um, and after we deployed the stent, we, we post dilated. Uh, we actually did an IVERS first actually. Mm. Yeah, so we actually did an... Uh, uh, we, we post dilated then. We, uh, we, we post dilated with a 3.5 uh, NC uh, balloon uh, at high pressures approximately. Um, so this is actually the image of... Uh, of, of the of the RC after we post dilate. Can we show the IVERS run then? So we're deciding do whether further, or not... Do you further optimize it before IVERS? Yeah, you did. Okay. Uh, there's just the 3 5 nc before the IVERS. Okay, so here, here is the IVERS pullback from the uh, distal RCA. So this is the uh, distal, uh, distal to the stand. So this is the area with uh, relatively normal vessel that we were aiming for. And you can see the operators managed to uh, land the distal uh, each of the stents right there. So no distal edge uh, complications there. Um, so uh, this is pulling back within the uh, stent, some areas uh, within the uh, vessel, some areas are a little bit more eccentrically uh, expanded because of the uh, eccentric calcification. 
Um, but you know, we, 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 we can't help that. Um, so pulling back the areas, um, all look pretty okay. I'm just going to pull it back so it's a little bit faster. So yeah, again, some areas of eccentricity, but overall, uh, the, 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 the lumen is okay. So this is uh, the proximal edge. So we want to see where our stent uh, ended up uh, proximally. Uh, we were aiming to try not to stick out into the uh, aorta. And uh, so as we can see here, right at the ostium. So the, so the stent, I think is pretty okay. So slightly, uh, if I can go just frame by frame, there's a little, a little bit of pistoning in the, uh, during the pullback because the guy was uh, disengaged. Um, but as you can see, there's hardly any stent. There's maybe a little bit like a half a circumference of the stent, uh, just a little bit outside into the aorta, but certainly uh, 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 otherwise very good uh, 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 positioning. Uh, the area at the uh, ostium is about 10.7 millimeters square. Uh, we were considering whether or not to uh, upsize to a 4 millimeter uh, NC balloon, but everything's well opposed. The final uh, areas were pretty good. Um, so I think the uh, operators uh, uh, accepted um, those values. Um, distal um, vessel reference uh, lumen area of 6.8 uh, millimeter square. And as I was surfing through the uh, stent looking for uh, areas of uh, under expansion, the smallest uh, areas I could get were also about 6.97 millimeter square. Uh, so those are uh, bigger than the distal reference. So that, that bodes well for our uh, patient's uh, long-term uh, uh, outcomes uh, in terms of IVIS uh, findings. Thanks. Looks like How about the mid, mid RCA, the one that from the angels doesn't seem like fully expanded. Your original calcium area. Just after the RV branch, yeah, around there. Yeah, is, yeah. That, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Yeah. So that that's probably going to be somewhere around uh, here. What Would you the... have done anything different though, uh, Kohan? Yeah. Yeah, that's why I want to look at the iris whether the luminal area is is good. Yeah, I'm very happy with the proximal and the distal <clears throat> area, but based on the angel, looks like the the mid part where the RV branch start coming in doesn't like fully expanded. So I would like to look at that. And yeah, if your luminal area is, is like what you're showing about seven, then then a bit more, <clears throat> you're more yeah, comfortable. I I, yeah, I know what you mean. There seems to be like a bit of a step down uh, yeah, after the RV branch, but I can't find any areas which are tighter yeah. than, than I, this. I think that area is actually quite eccentric because if you see on the LAO, it does look a bit under, <laughs> but then on the AP uh, view, you don't really appreciate that kind of uh, step down. So so I think it's a little bit of a, of a eccentricity. La. We went I agree, I agree. but I think that, that shows the importance of imaging here yeah, because when I'm not sure, just yep. looking at the angel. Yeah, mm. yeah, yep. <clears throat> uh, actually, there's a question from the audience. Uh, Harris is asking me which she can can answer this. You were already putting such long stents. Uh, why why were you so concerned about not stenting until the ostium? It is still a little bit dizzy. Yeah, well, I think it's mainly a technical issue because you know stenting to the ostium, um, I to me increases the complexity of the of the of the procedure quite a fair bit yeah you have to disengage the guide and that makes the whole system a little bit less stable and then um, you know because the concern is you don't want to miss the ostium if you you really want to touch it and then of course sometimes you can inadvertently stick it out so if you stick it out too much there's a theoretical risk of you know thrombosis etc and if you ever need to come back then uh, it's it's always very challenging so so for me I try to not touch the ostium unless I, I have to. Having said that, in this case where the, the gap is not that much, uh, I think actually it is also difficult to, um, to, 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 to just leave that gap because that one to two millimeters, you, you don't know, right? It's a kind of in segment. Um, it could also be uh, an idus for like um, you know, accelerated atherosclerosis. So, so, so just, just to summarize, it's, it's more difficult uh, to stand to precisely to the ostium. So that's why I will try to avoid it as much as possible. Dr. Gaku, you saw the IVIS. Uh, uh, what do you think of the final results? Dr. Gaku, any comments from you? 
I think he's uh, probably can't hear us. Uh, Chris, how about yeah, yourself? I, yeah. <clears throat> can you hear me? Oh, yeah, can hear you now. Okay, so sorry for the back bad connection, but uh, uh, avoiding the right coronary artery osteopenthing is also there's one more reason because uh, there's a high percentage of wrist stenosis in this division because of the hinge motion and uh, because because of that hinge motion plus maybe you, if you have calcification at the osteum the RCA you have high chance of wrist stenosis so. In this case, it's okay because there, there's not much uh, severe calcification or large hinge motion. But uh, in that, in such cases, it's you should avoid osteostenting. I see. Thank you, uh, Dr. Beatrice. Any comments about this uh, case in general? No, only congratulate because they treat uh, a right coronary artery that was a diffuse disease that is not always easy to treat this kind of right coronary artery because you cannot use a, a really strong catheters. You don't have a good really support and they treat really elegant uh, using IBUS to see the calcification. They treat according to IBUS. They didn't need uh, cutting balloon or rata because the IBUS didn't show the signs of severe calcification. And finally, they use a, a stent that is a good choice. We had the discussion about dracolutin balloon or a stent, but we thought that in that case, because of the calcification, maybe the drug of the dracolutin balloon was not really optimal for this case. So excellent result. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Great comments, sir. Chitang and Idu, perhaps you can take us through the final uh, conclusion and teaching moments here. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think the final conclusion, this patient actually had a, a dual vessel, triple vessel disease uh, and came for a stage procedure to the right. He had a diffuse uh, disease from proximal to, to even actually distal and RPDA disease. But we elected to stand the, the proximal lesions. And uh, I was sure actually uh, mainly fibrocalcific, uh, not so heavily calcified. So we managed to get by of a scoring balloon. And then we put two uh, long stands. Uh, cover from the ostium to, to a proper landing zone that we could find. Yeah, yeah. For, for, for me, actually, I, I, I really enjoy this case, actually. Um, um, coming in here, I was expecting something, you know, to be um, maybe very difficult, very small caliber. And I think this um, actually is very instructive because with the IVUS, we had the confidence to go really big. And uh, if you told me beforehand that we would be putting three, five uh, stents into this uh, RCA, I, I would probably have thought um, I was looking at the wrong case initially. So, so really quite surprising and pleasantly surprised by this. And um, yeah, so it's always nice to learn something new, especially on a Friday afternoon. Um, Chiang, you have uh, some uh, uh, pearls no, of wisdom? <laughs> no, no, nothing substantial to add. I think, I think like uh, the other operators have said, it was a very fun case to do, I think. I think we uh, 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 learned quite a bit. And I think imaging really did help in this case. Um, uh, it was nice to see the the the, the products uh, uh, work as well as they did. Uh, the stent was certainly very deliverable, and um, uh, yeah, I think I think overall the case was uh, yep. uh, as good as we could have hoped <laughs> for it to go. Uh, one one question for you guys: uh, How long are you putting on the DAPT? Noting that you have stents on both sides of the arm. I think he, he came in with a st end STEMI, so uh, we'll continue one year. DAPT, unless there's, there's bleeding issues, then we will we'll shorten it. So with the ACS indication, you guys are still keen on with multiple yes, long segments. Yes, still keep it for a year. So again, congratulations. I, I really enjoyed your case as well. It may look straightforward, although it probably wasn't that straightforward. <laughs> and excellent results, uh, imaging guided. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience for saying all the way to five o'clock, my uh, speakers, Dr. Patel and Dr. Beatrice great talks, as well as my panelists. I, I like to just state my final concluding remarks about this case. Uh, I, I thought what was demonstrative, particularly uh, one, that whenever you encounter diffuse disease, imaging guidance is probably key. What, what they show out was that it did change strategy in a few ways. One, it had very accurate sizing and definition of disease where you actually need to park and don't need to do. It actually helped you define your strategy that you don't need artrectomy. You had a very good pause moment where you adjudicated that your pre was adequate. And it did help you define 
whether you can go with a stenting or a DCB strategy based on what you saw in the dissection as well. And just to re rehash, uh, I think in the ultimate trial show us that when you do this, uh, you turn a small vessel, what looks like angiography diffuse disease, actually it's a big vessel, you just diffuse the disease down. And you had uh, landing zones that didn't have dissection, you have proper sizing, you had lumen size gain that is more than 90% of the distal reference. And uh, of course, you didn't land in any plug segments. So this is a good criteria. I think the latest imaging guided trials that ultimately did show that you will have durable results. And the other important point in this case, of course, is that the patient subset beyond ACS is also high bleeding risk. So with this well-performed, adequately sized imaging guided procedure, even if you do have an occasion to shorten or interrupt the DAPT, I think you'll have full confidence in doing so. So in this day and age, when we're dealing with this complex calcium diffuse disease, ACS, elderly subset, high bleeding risk, I think it's beholden to achieve this kind of results that uh, the team showed today. So with that, I, I think we also had the chance to have a new uh, pre dilatation balloon, a trio. I haven't used it before. looks very good. As well as a frontier onyx stand that really flew down uh, that artery, uh, even when the Ivers catheter couldn't. So a great demonstration all around from the team at Sinkang Cath Lab from the National Heart Center, Singapore. So with that, thank you very much uh, for the two hours uh, time spent with us and uh, keep safe and I'll uh, see you guys very soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.